Dino McCain, thank you for another opportunity to be able to share and teach the word of Elohim. Pray most high that as the word goes forth, as we continue teaching in Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 17, we pick up from last week the portion that we did not get recorded. That you would have your way, that you would move sovereignly, that you would touch the lives of those who would be hearing this teaching, and that your great name would be praised. So, Abba, we thank you right now and ask for your wisdom and guidance that the anointing of your Ruach will cause the teaching to be brought forth with power and clarity. Thank you in the mighty name of Yahshu. Amen. Blessed be the Almighty. We've been talking about the section of scripture, Colossians 2, 16 through 17, and we've been dealing with the Judaizer and explaining how the Judaizer was primarily concerned with the issue of circumcision as it pertained to the first century and what the Judaizers' main mission was in getting individuals converted, whether they were going to be converted to the Pharisaic philosophy of the faith of Israel, or if they were coming to the Messiah and those who were in the Messiah at that time, but were part of the sect of the Pharisees, or I'll just say it came out from the sect of the Pharisees. Their idea, as we've already discussed, had been that individuals needed to be circumcised as well as have faith in the Messiah. It was important that we noted those things as we're dealing with Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17, because in order for us to understand this passage in the most accurate sense, we needed to talk about the Judaizer. We needed to discuss the Judaizer's function, what things the Judaizer found to be of utmost importance, and also to make very clear that the Judaizer was not concerned about trying to enforce Torah observance, which would include keeping of any of the commandments or Sabbaths or feasts. They never enforced any of that because if an individual was not circumcised, then it was fruitless to enforce Torah observance, especially since an individual was not allowed to participate in any of the functions that were related to the worship at the temple or anything related to sacrifice. If you weren't circumcised, you couldn't do any of those things. But now there's another aspect that we need to talk about that'll help us to understand Colossians 2, 16 through 17 a bit more accurately, because we, we want to look at uh, this piece now, and this has to do with the Gerim. This is just a term that refers to the, what was called the half proselyte or the proselyte of the gate. Uh, in many instances, there's another phrase that's used, which is referred to as one who worshiped Elohim more commonly translated in the Bible as a worshiper of God, or one who worshiped 
God. I like to use uh, the term Elohim for uh, the use of referring to the title of the Most High instead of using the translation of God in particular. I'm more comfortable with that. And so what we see, those who were regarded as worshipers of Elohim, uh, half proselyte, proselyte of the gate, these are all synonymous terms for the Gerim. These were individuals who had not fully converted to the faith of Israel. What that means is that they had not taken the necessary steps to offer sacrifice, undergo circumcision if they were a male, and to be immersed in water. These were the three major things that had to be done in order for a person to be regarded as a complete full-fledged member of the house of Israel. By doing those things, an individual would now be regarded as an Israelite, a citizen of the house of Israel with all rights and privileges, and would be regarded as one that was indeed born among the family of the house of Israel. So those individuals that had not done those things as of yet, but had a desire and a passion to approach to the Most High and wanted to serve the Almighty, these individuals were in this other category, and they were looked at as half proselytes. And so as we talk more about the half proselyte and we look at them, we need to be mindful that there are some things that went along with this. You know, when I was um, a much younger believer and I was uh, taught about those individuals who were worshipers of God, and who were uh, at this position, you know, I didn't get a lot of information or details about what they actually had to do in order to become a worshiper of Elohim. But in all actuality, there was something that an individual had to do in order to be regarded as a Gerim or one who worshiped Elohim. If a person desired to approach the Almighty back in that time, and they did not want to undergo full conversion, they could be put in this category of being a half proselyte. What they had to do was come before the leadership and they had to make a pledge this pledge that they had to make involved keeping the holiness code. Now, the holiness code was a set of commandments in the Torah, and the outline of those commandments in the Torah, if you want to find out what they are, we can look in the scripture. The scripture has a, um, an example that's given to us. And the example of the holiness code is noted in what James had called these necessary things in the book of Acts. And so I want to go there first and look at that first real quick. And then I'm going to take some time to explain what all of that meant uh, as it pertained to the half proselytes. So let's go to Acts chapter 15. Let's go to that 
I want to go to Acts chapter 15. Blessed be he. Hallelujah. All right. So now in Acts chapter 15, we want to look at verse 28, and then I'm going to read on till we get down to roughly round about the 30th verse. But let's, let's just hear this, because here is where we have information in the scripture where we see these necessary things that James or Yaakov had noted, which was a part of what the individual who was making the pledge had to keep. So, verse 28, it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, all right? That you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare ye well. I'll stop right there. I didn't read verse 30. But anyway, these particular things that were noted, we find not to eat things, that were offered to idols from blood, things strangled, and from fornication. There were four things. Now, these four things were in all actuality four subheadings of sections of Torah commands that dealt with Areas that pertain to, for example, anything that was related to foods offered to idols and anything related to idolatry. There was a section in Torah that dealt with that. And that particular statement had to deal with the whole section. So a person who was told that they needed to be instructed in these things were instructed in all of these areas. And it's important that we catch that. It also notes that an individual would be instructed in things pertaining to blood pollutions. And there's a section in Torah that refers to blood pollutions. Included in that is also the, the menstruation. If you're around a woman who's menstruating, I mean, it, it goes into all the details. It also deals with things strangled. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about uh, things strangled because for those who are not familiar with this particular phrase, you need to know something about the Torah and the whole section that dealt with the dietary commands and proper slaughter of animals. Now that phrase where it says things slaughtered, it has to do with the proper slaughter of animals that could be eaten. Now, when you go to the section that deals with that, it begins by saying that you don't eat anything with the blood in it among all of the animals that can be eaten. And so it was understood in that time frame that those who would be taught and instructed about things strangled were actually being taught about the proper slaughter of animals and also they were taught which animals were permitted for consumption. So basically, you had the dietary laws 
that were given and that this was also a part of what the Gerim had made a pledge to be obedient to. And just so we can understand why it said things strangled. The idea is that when an animal was slaughtered, all of the blood was supposed to drain out of that animal. Once you cut the throat, all of the blood would drain out. And once the animal is regarded as being dead, its life is gone, all of the blood is gone, then the individual can commence with the dismembering of the animal and whatever they were going to do with it, however they were going to cook it, roast it, boil it, whatever they were going to do, they could do that. Uh, and what was uh, being done, however, outside of the framework of the Israelite community, among those who were pagans, when they would slaughter an animal, while the blood is still coming out of the animal and the animal is gurgling or strangling on its blood, they would begin to dismember the animal. And this is what this scripture is actually referring to, that the practice that was done among the pagans is something that is not supposed to be done among those who are following the Most High and keeping his Torah. So when it talks about to abstain from things strangled, it's saying do not participate in the slaughter of an animal that while it is still strangling in its blood. In other words, all of the blood hasn't come out yet. The animal is still partially alive. You don't begin dismembering it. All right? So this is the thing that that's talking about in that passage. And much of the time, the average believer doesn't have a clue that that's what that means. And so I'm taking time to explain it so that we'll understand that these particular items that James referred to as these necessary things are a part of the holiness code that a half proselyte made a pledge to commit to. Now, the fourth thing that's mentioned has to do with fornication or abstaining from sexual immorality. You go in the Torah, in particular, if you look in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, I believe it is, it gives a whole rundown of all of the commandments that are related to sexual immorality. It talks about sex with uh, relatives that's not permitted. It talks about sex with uh, the same sex that the scripture prohibits. It talks about sex with animals that's uh, prohibited. Let, let me say that that's prohibited. I think I said not prohibited. I didn't mean that. That's prohibited. These types of uh, sexual involvements, the scripture prohibits them. And so in Leviticus chapter 18, there's this whole list of prohibitions on various types of acts of sex. And so when it talks about abstaining from fornication, as is translated here in what we've read, is stating that you were abstaining from all forms of sexual immorality. And there was a whole listing of that. So these four necessary things that are noted here in Acts, this entailed, I would say, the subsections, that's what they were. They were the subheadings of the major areas of the holiness code. And so when a person decided to 
become a half proselyte, they made a pledge to keep all of these commandments. And included in that was also keeping the Sabbath and keeping all of the commands so far as they could within the restrictions of not being able to participate in the temple worship. Because if a person was not circumcised, they could not go into the area of the temple which was regarded as the portion for the Israelites. See, there were a couple different uh, compartments there in the, in the temple grounds. You had the court of the Israelites, which was the main area of the temple compound. And inside of the court of Israel is where you had the actual temple itself. Sacrifice and offering was made in that area. But there was a, uh, a wall, a partition, if you allow me to say that, that would surround the court of the Israelites and it would enclose that area and also the temple. And outside of that partition, outside of that wall, there was an area called the court of the nations or the court of the Gentiles. That particular area was the area where the half proselytes, those who were called, they also called them righteous Gentiles. That's where they could go and stand and be able to participate in the worship of the Most High, albeit separated from being able to participate in the offering of sacrifices. And so this was as far as they could go. They had boundaries as to where the half proselyte could be. They could be close somewhat in approaching to the Almighty, but not right there in the midst of it all. So you had restrictions, divisions that were there. And so for all intents and purposes, what we need to be mindful of is that those individuals that were Gentiles and that were half proselytes now, they were keeping all of the commandments. See, now this, this is, uh, I would say, for the average believer, new news. I remember uh, as a young believer, you know, we were taught basically that all the Gentiles that were in the Messiah, they continued to live a Gentile life and uh, they continued to eat whatever they wanted to eat and, um, you know, basically do whatever they wanted to do. And, and there was this great separation between them and the Gentile, Gentile and the Jew. You know, I mean, it was such great distinction. This is how the teaching was presented. But, you know, as I began to discover the, the details of what actually was occurring in the first century within the framework of the Messianic Israelite community, which was a part of the larger framework of the faith of Israel. So what, what do I mean by that when I say larger framework of the faith of Israel? This is the picture that I need to present. In the first century, you had the, the Pharisees at that time and the Sadducees. Those were two of the major faith communities or sects within the uh, faith of Israel that had great influence. And then you had this other emerging faith community within the framework of Israel called the sect of the Nazarenes. And the sect of the Nazarenes were what I call the Messianic Israelite community. These were those who followed the Messiah. See, Messiah was from Nazareth. And so they regarded to those who followed him and that 
religious leadership, the apostles, they, they were the leaders of the sect of the Nazarenes. But from the standpoint of someone that was not a believer and follower in any way, shape, or form of the Most High, they saw all of the three sects as being all under one umbrella of the faith of Israel. And it's important that we be mindful of that. And all of those three Israelite sects interacted with each other and saw each other as still being a part of the entire Israelite family. And it's important that we know that because when you see the picture that way, then we're able to understand some of these passages in the scripture a bit more accurately. We're able to understand with a little bit more clarity as to what were the potential things that were possibly going on at that time. It's really important that we understand that. All right? So now that we get the picture, we aren't, we aren't looking at the sect of the Nazarenes, which are the, the, the followers of the Messiah, as being some group that is completely detached, so to speak, from Torah. Because all of them were keeping Torah. There was no difference in how they were living and practicing their faith. That needs to be understood. And that's something that is not understood within the uh, larger framework of the present Christian community. And it needs to be. And so when we consider that, what we find is that we have Gentile believers that actually are living Torah observant lives. This is what was actually going on in the first century. Now, even though I, I've said this and I, and I provided some scripture to prove that, we have documentation by historians that confirm the fact that the believers of the first century, both Hebrew and